Dr. Joseph Boyd. He is Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, also a political science professor. Um, he received his degree from Carroll College in Montana in political science and a PhD and master's degree from the University of Notre Dame in political science. So we are really honored to have him share some of his expertise on the intersections between politics and popular culture. Please give him your full attention and we will have time for question and answer at the end of this talk. All right, thank you very much, Elise. Thank you. I, I really do have to extend a, a special thanks uh, tonight of, uh, in particular. Not only is it wet and it was incredibly foggy, so to venture out, thanks. Uh, the fact that you did it on Mardi Gras confuses me. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, later on tonight, I hear that there is actually something, for those of you who are just here for the politics, that there's also something else happening tonight, some kind of joint address to Congress or something. So, uh, so thank you very much for, for spending this time uh, here and, and having this conversation. Uh, hopefully, uh, it, will, it will be worth uh, the, the effort uh, and the putting off of, of the eating of the last remnants of king cake. Uh, the, the, the content uh, of this talk actually was something that uh, comes from a chapter that I wrote for uh, the philosophy of Christopher Nolan, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the film uh, director who's uh, you know, famous for, for movies like Inception, uh, and then of course uh, the Dark Knight uh, trilogy, uh, and trying to find a consistency within uh, an approach to the philosophy of Christopher Nolan. Um, I say that primarily because I originally wrote this chapter uh, in 2014, uh, and sort of put together this talk uh, about a week before the elections. And I say that because uh, there are a lot of parallels that folks are gonna be able to draw to contemporary events, which is fantastic. Uh, it's also completely unintentional. Uh, but I think that it shows the importance uh, of this kind of research agenda and this kind of research project. Uh, because it's not so much that we use popular culture to say, see, this event is explained now. Uh, instead, it's to look at the theoretical framework, what happens when we watch or consume popular culture that begins to frame our ideas, begins to frame our conceptions, and helps us then to start to understand the events that are happening around us through a very particular filter and through a very particular frame. So all of that being said, feel free to draw parallels. I, I, I hope that you will. I hope we can engage in that conversation. Uh, but to talk, uh, uh, to, to get started uh, tonight, what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit uh, about uh, that research agenda uh, that, that I mentioned looking at popular culture uh, as a, a mode of understanding politics. Uh, I have uh, I've done a, a number uh, of books uh, and articles uh, related to popular culture as a means of understanding uh, the political realm. Uh, and I did so for really a reason. Uh, it started off because I had an opportunity to write something for the X-Files of philosophy. And I was a big X-Files geek, and so I'm not gonna turn that down. Uh, and then actually the more I started to explore that, uh, I began to realize I honestly don't believe that there's anything more important that I can study when it comes to politics and political science. That's not to say that there aren't other important questions out there right now. Uh, I just honestly believe with where America is uh, in terms of its overall consumption of, uh, of entertainment, uh, the way in which we engage politics through entertainment forums and through forums of popular culture, whether that be social media, through the, the films, television, the songs that, that we watch, uh, when football becomes uh, uh, political, uh, when all of those things become the subject of politics, I think it's incredibly important that we understand what is it that people are consuming, how are they consuming it, and what is the implication uh, that that might have uh, when it comes to the, the formation of values or of identity. And so I'm gonna actually start back, and I, I have that, that famous picture of Plato and Aristotle uh, uh, sort of juxtaposed with, uh, with Superman and Batman, uh, and actually it was for a reason that I, that I chose the supposedly uh, in this famous picture of, uh, of Plato uh, and Aristotle, uh, you have Plato uh, sort of pointing up uh, to sort of describe the forms, uh, you know, the ideals uh, as it relates to politics, whereas Aristotle has his hand down, uh, almost like it's bringing us down to earth and to think about the practical. And that's certainly something that becomes represented in these two iconic figures, right? The, the heroic ideal that is not even of uh, this planet, right, is of the ether, uh, is the Superman. Uh, and then the one who engages in the much more practical, 
down to earth, this is what has to be done uh, in order to uh, accomplish that. So that's why uh, that image, by the way, was, was, was selected. And it's there actually that I want to start uh, in thinking about the, the ancient Greeks to sort of think about why even talk about Batman? Why spend time on these films? Why is this even interesting? Uh, and in part it's because uh, when we think about uh, some of the early writings of individuals like Plato, uh, he talks about art as being a form of imitation or mimesis, right? That there is the form, the ideal that is out there. Right, that we can think of an ideal that is justice. Right? Then there's the construct, right? how we form laws or how we form society in order to try to represent uh, that, that justice, to, right, to try to represent that ideal. We have an abstract understanding of what justice is, and then we write laws, we build judicial systems to try to then uh, impose that justice or create a vehicle for that justice to exist. And then Plato says there's also the artistic rendering, which he feels is, is, is an incredibly far removed, uh, 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 horrible representation of what that form is, right? That rather than even being an actual physical representation, it's a mimic of even that. That art removes us farther and farther away from the form that is justice. Uh, he writes in the Republic, then imitation is far removed from the truth, for it touches only a small part of each thing, and a part of that itself is only an image. But it's also interesting to note that Plato's criticism of art was not because it was irrelevant. It was not because it was unimportant. It was actually so relevant and so important that he felt that things like poems, songs, plays, all had to be sanctioned and edited or completely banned if they imparted the wrong kinds of ideas. And the reason for that is because he felt as though that while this art is imitating, while it is mimicking uh, society around us, it also appeals to a very raw place in us, right? An irrational place, but a place where we can be moved a place where we can actually form identity and see value, even if it's not based on rationality. In other words, Socrates' big fear was that if we told the wrong kinds of stories, then the implications of that are going to be that we're gonna have the wrong kinds of citizens who are going to pursue the wrong kinds of goals in a society that is horribly improperly structured. In other words, art becomes so important that it can begin to trump reason, that it can begin to move us down a path where it's entirely based on emotion, and it can actually then become more influential in public discourse and deliberation than even rational thought. So in that regard, Plato is saying that it's really critical for us to think about artistry to think about entertainment because we have to then understand the implications that that entertainment is gonna have on an overall society. In my mind, that becomes all the more critical within a democratic society when what we're consuming, if in fact, it is as powerful as Plato suggests and as numbers of political thinkers uh, have suggested sent Plato, if we're relying on democratic discourse to lead us to making decisions then what happens when our art, when our popular culture, when our entertainment begins to form our conversations more so than rational, deliberative thought about evidence in public conversation? Now I say this as if somehow I'm going to sit here and tell you that then movies are entirely bad, that it's all horrible, uh, and that's just not the case. Because like with almost everything that's out there, there are positive sides to that same kind of dark side that exists, right? So just as art might persuade us to think irrationally, there might actually be some value to that. And one of the thinkers that, that, that I often uh, reflect on uh, in, in being uh, somebody who represents uh, some of the positive things that can come out of those emotional appeals uh, is a, a philosopher who comes, of course, much, much, much later uh, than the thinker like Plato, uh, Richard Rorty. Uh, 
And Rorty talks about something known as sentimental education. He links it to the novel, and it's becoming more broadly linked to any stories, in particular epic stories, that have the ability to get us to think about individuals who are different than we are, to think about things like equality and like justice that may not be able to be represented in a purely rational or reasoned fashion. In other words, Rorty talks about the possibility of democracy being able to feel yourself in the struggles of others, to be able to see yourself represented in the struggles that other individuals are going through. Because then and only then can we start making decisions not in our interest, but in a public interest. Because we begin to see the human connection rather than just whatever my self-interested or rational ends happen to be for me, I can begin to see that extracted onto others. So Rorty actually makes very controversial claims about things like the novels uh, uh, where, where uh, he got in a lot of trouble uh, at one point in time where he talked about how uh, a book, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, did more for civil rights than any direct action politic movement did. Right? I think he's overstating the case, by the way. But I think he also has a point about the power of those novels to be able to enable us to see other, ourselves in other individuals, to be able to feel their struggles and to make those our own. And those same kinds of things happen when we start consuming films, when we start consuming television, when we feel a song for its politics, as much as it is that we think deliberately, deliberatively about evidence that might be presented to us. And so from that respect, popular culture does have the ability to make people think and to make people feel to move individuals towards conclusions, and therefore is incredibly important for us to think about as scholars within American political society. Because democracy is really about a defined public sphere, uh, about ways in which we interact with one another. And I had mentioned before that I feel as though uh, this research agenda is the most important one that I can engage in primarily because so much uh, of, uh, of, of politics, of political science, has been focused on a, a traditional conception of the public sphere as being a space for individuals to have discussions about public concern, engage in political discussion and activism with a goal of having outcomes of policy formation. I guess I would ask you, is that where politics stops? Is all politics about people coming together and having conversations within an open public forum in order to try to influence policy formation through activism? It's part of it. What are, what are some other examples that, that, that you might raise about uh, other types of political activity? Social media pops to mind immediately. Um, discussion, literary discussions can border on it. Um, I think about <clears throat> music in the 60s and the Vietnam protests. So. Okay. Are others, other, other thoughts that haven't been covered there about where politics is taking place besides just in these direct action activities? And closed doors where transactions are being made between excellent. big donors and people with power. Excellent, excellent, right? So we, we can envision right, the, the sort of the cloistered rooms uh, where, where power uh, deliberations and negotiations are happening outside of a public sphere. How about in the home? Right? Politics happening there just as much as it is within these larger frameworks where values are imparted, where structures of power are certainly played out in a wide variety of different forms. You see, the public sphere then is, is these things, are these things, is these things. I'll have to think about that. Uh, uh, the public sphere certainly does have this traditional orientation. 
Habermas and others are not wrong about that. But I would argue that there's also an expanded understanding of the public sphere that deals as much with the policy-oriented activity, protest, direct action politics, as it does about the formation of political identity. Right? You mentioned social media. Right? And we know, uh, hopefully, of, of the studies that have come out of how people become uh, uh, sort of very selective about the kinds of information that they'll get on their feeds that come through not typically as rational arguments based on evidence, right? but of memes, of short videos, right? of songs, of cartoons that are all reinforcing or in some cases actually forming identity that people have that enable them to think very specifically about the world around them. So my argument for popular culture and its importance is not to say that traditional direct action politics, that traditional conceptions of the public sphere, that traditional conceptions of democracy are wrong, but instead that we need to expand our understanding of that. We need to see popular culture as performing a political function. In this way, I would argue that popular culture can uh, perform four very democratic, small d democratic functions within our society. That it can expose us to issues that might not otherwise be overlooked, and I should also add on to there, or overlook issues, which is also equally powerful. It can legitimize viewpoints that were previously marginalized, or it can reinforce values and structures and propositions that are held at the mainstream, that are held at the core of cultural belief. Popular culture can set agendas, introducing ideas to the public conversation, and it can also frame questions within a political context so that when we begin to think about questions, we're thinking about it not from some kind of objective or removed framework, but through a filter of how we've come to understand based on, uh, understand the world based on these images, ideas, uh, and values that are imparted through the kinds of things that we're consuming through popular culture. Okay. Then how do we address the issue of popular culture being a blend of entertainment and fact, and almost becoming that, quote, unedited art that was discussed earlier, where people accept popular culture as fact when it is a blend? most of the time. It's a blend of opinion, it's a blend of fact, and then it's a blend of pure entertainment at times. You know, we don't always have the authors who at the end of the book say, by the way, these are the things that are fact and these are the things that are a product of my imagination to make it more interesting. Mm -hmm. So how does that then impact the way opinions then are formed in regards to popular culture just not being accepted per bunch? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a really great question. Uh, and, and my snarky answer is going to be, you could have easily taken the words popular culture and just insert political discourse into what you just said. Yeah. And it's a mix of fact, opinion, and entertainment. And entertainment. Right, and, and at the end, we don't have politicians who are coming out and saying, okay, here's what I know is fact. Here's some of the stuff that I'm just kind of making up. Uh, and here are things that I'm just throwing out there as red meat to appeal to constituents. Right? In, in a lot of ways, the reason why uh, then uh, the, the other sort of half of this is not to just say, hey, popular culture is really important. It's also then to start to decontextualize uh, uh, what's happening within popular culture so that we can understand the threads going through. So that as then consumers of this entertainment uh, uh, media, uh, entertainment culture, you know, widespread ubiquitous consumerism, we can become uh, more critical thinkers more critical consumers so that we know what we're seeing when it's being imparted to us. Um, so a, a recent example that I can, that I can think of uh, that, uh, uh, that I, I was struggling with, and Elise and I were talking about this, was uh, uh, I was just at a conference where a graduate student uh, who uh, is a native Hawaiian uh, was presenting about the, the Disney film Moana. Uh, and, uh, and went through, here's what's happening in this story and then she went through and said, now here are all of the ways that Disney has taken these different Pacific Islander myth narratives, lumped them together in a way that, uh, that doesn't make any sense from a traditional cultural perspective, 
and more importantly, is incredibly damaging uh, to, uh, to the culture uh, and the way that it perceives itself. Right? So in that way, what she's, what she's doing is she's saying, you know, Disney has this power, right? And on the surface, they're actually seeming like they're doing this sort of very inclusive, uh, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, uh, progressive uh, kind of programming, right? Where they're going to take a, a, a Polynesian uh, myth and, uh, and represent it uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, heroes that, that don't look like traditional Disney princesses did. Right, doing things that traditional Disney princesses didn't do, but also doing it in a way that, that really undermines some elements of Pacific Island culture. Um, in particular, the idea, and spoiler alert, I do this a lot, by the way, uh, uh, when Maui steals the, the, the heart right, that causes right, this whole thing to happen, right, first of all, that's not part of their myths. Right? Maui is essentially uh, a Pacific Islander Hercules. Right? I mean, that's the kind of myth that Maui is to represent. But moreover, uh, and this I found really powerful uh, when, uh, when she presented on this, was uh, that essentially then, uh, once Maui does that, right, that's what leads to a lot of the natural devastation then in the film. Right? And it has to be restored. Essentially saying that it wasn't through colonialization that the, uh, uh, the native populations within the Pacific Islands were decimated, but that they did that to themselves. Right? It was their gods, it was their culture that was destroying it and that it had to be reset somehow. Right? And so in that way, then there is this, this element to where these stories can introduce us to thinking about cultures differently and it can also distort it in a way. So this project, and that's a very long story to say that this project uh, is really designed to get us to consume entertainment. Right? That's gonna happen but to become really critical consumers of entertainment to ask what's really happening here? What are the implications of that? And to bring it around to why I think you all are here tonight, and I was going to do this like this the whole night, but I wanted to keep my voice uh, once I switched over to Batman, so I, I'm not going to even try anymore. Uh, but this, this, you know, this idea uh, that popular culture uh, is, uh, uh, is critical for us to understand is represented in the popularity uh, of the image of the Dark Knight, the image of the Batman, right? which, which helped to actually propel a resurgence uh, in consumerism uh, centered around uh, the, the superhero uh, movie, the superhero epic film. So now we have almost every movie it seemed like that's being made is some new superhero spinoff. Right? Uh, or some continuation of superhero stories. Um, and so whether we're talking about really the, the, one of the, the resurgence uh, of Batman with the, the, the Michael Keaton uh, film that sort of initially rebooted Batman and initially sort of brought superhero stories back in, uh, to then Alan Moore's uh, uh, comic The Killing Joke, uh, really helping to kind of reframe what the modern superhero is, Batman becomes a representation of what almost all of these superhero films are doing, whether we recognize it or not. In other words, Batman becomes quite literally a symbol, but in this way, not necessarily of just these stories, but of a symbol that becomes a way that we can understand the superhero narrative and almost all action films, as superhero films are a subgenre uh, of the larger action hero framework. Because there are a number of elements that are present within a film like Batman that are ever present in our, uh, in our action hero genres, in our action hero films and movies. See, Dark Knight uh, is, as an action film, uh, falls very strongly and very heavily into that action hero genre. Uh, where Carl Burgitz, uh, who, uh, who had contributed to the, the, the Homer Simpson Ponders politics, looking at the action hero film, sets a, a theoretical framework for understanding the, the, the politics uh, of the action hero movie that I think is best summarized uh, in this quotation. The action hero movie values emotion over reason, intuition over empiricism, order over rights, uncompromising action over debate and due process, suspicion over tolerance. The genre does not redeem or validate anything fundamental about American judicial or political ideals, 
or Enlightenment values. Rather, it repudiates foundation of American liberal political theory. Think about that for a minute. Right? What's more quintessentially American right, than, than John Wayne and, and John McClain? Right? These action heroes who are essentially doing everything to violate the foundational principles on which American political culture is allegedly based. And Batman as a representative of this genre, is perhaps one of the worst when it comes to violating rights, placing order over any consideration of rights, willing to torture, willing to engage in extraordinary rendition, willing to act over international lines at any point in time, never placing himself uh, to actually considering due process of law, but instead just doing what needs to be done to restore order and to protect the people. And so Batman in a lot of ways reflects this ongoing conflict in our own political discourse because it really is setting that action hero narrative up against the liberal values that are America's political core. I should stop for a second and say, when political theorists refer to liberal values, who wants to take a stab at what that means? What is, what is liberalism? Democracy, human rights, respect for individual liberty. Excellent, All right, I, and that, that, that you know, is, Represented, right, in that, in that, in that top one, I should, I should ask the questions before I advance the slides. But no, absolutely, right? I mean, at the core of liberalism is the emphasis on individual rights, on the individual's freedom, on an individual's liberty. And the notion that no individual, by their birthright, is better or more entitled than any other individual. That instead, we have the right of law, we have due process of law, that makes everyone equal under the law, and that we are to have those rights that help us to engage individually in the pursuit of our own understanding of the good within a social framework. I have what I believe is good. Each of you have your understandings of what are good. Sometimes we might intersect and find that we share commonalities in our perceptions of the good, and other times we're going to differ radically and how we understand the good life and what is good and what is valuable. Liberalism is a political theory that establishes a framework in which we can all have those different conceptions of the good and pursue them. Now that makes liberalism sound pretty sweet, in part because that's what a lot of our American political traditions are rooted in. Right? Or this Lockean, then Jeffersonian, Madisonian understanding of individual rights as being incredibly important, enshrined in public documents. But as much as America has a liberal foundation, America also has very strongly defined conservative traditions. What do I mean by conservatism? And don't just, I should cover that up. <laughs> what does conservatism mean as a, as a political theory? Pretty much exactly what you've got here. So, <coughs> respect for tradition. Uh, we go all the way back to the 18th century, the importance of monarchy in place and social order over the, the upsurge of disruptive liberal civil rights. Why emphasize tradition? What is it about traditionalism that is important for a conservative thinker? Is it just keeping things the way they are for keeping them the way they are? I believe that tradition is a good thing that can give moral order in the public order. Yeah, and, and guess what? Because it works, 
right? Conservatives argue that the reason why traditions exist and the reason why traditions survive and thrive is because of practical experience, right? That these things worked, and so there's a preservation of that tradition because they see society as being this repository of cumulative wisdom. In other words, that we have gone through a lot over time. We've gone through numerous changes, evolutions, revolutions, and that we begin to learn as human beings very practical ways of being able to solve political and social problems. And they say that those are largely solved not through sort of forcing through top-down change, but instead in preserving those traditional institutions that we value primarily because they work to the ends that we desire those institutions to work. So in that way, it's not just we're resisting things because we're stodgy or because we're uh, you know, we're, we're somehow uh, rooted in or stuck in our own ways, right? Conservatives feel it's critical that we preserve those institutions for the sheer fact that they do work, that they help us from making the big mistake, right? And then they'll point to revolutions around the world and say, see what happens in Russia when there's a revolution and what results from that? See what happens in China when there's a revolution and what results from that? See what happens in Cuba when there's a revolution and what results from that? Right? They talk about what happens in their minds as being detrimental when those traditional institutions and cultural repositories of wisdom are not preserved. And within the United States, when you just think about the political founding, it's clear to see the tensions in liberalism and conservatism. The tensions between individual rights and the sense that localism and religion and traditional cultural groups and communities should ultimately make decisions. So American political values are caught up in this tension between liberalism and conservatism. It's America in conflict and that's where the appeal of the superhero genre and the appeal of the D Dark Knight becomes, I think, very interesting to consider. Because the Dark Knight is certainly very, very different than the Adam West, right, sort of campy throwback. I hear that Dan Anhalt dances a really good Batusi, by the way. <laughs> so after it's all done, get him to give you the, the, the little cape and cowl moves. I'm going to say that I'm old enough to have watched the Adam West versions when they came out, not in the <laughs> I, I, I feel so badly because I think I was the only person in the Lego Batman movie who actually knew that Egghead was indeed an actual villain uh, in, uh, in the, ancient, the you know, ancient, ancient Batman movies <laughs> from the old texts. It scares me more that you went to the Lego version on your own. <laughs> I have children. I have children, and I wanted to tell them all about it when I got home. That's a joke. They, they came with me. Uh, but, but played by Vincent Price, by the way, if you're wondering about, uh, about Egghead. Uh, so, uh, so Christopher Nolan uh, uh, gives us a version of Batman that is very political and is centered around this tension between liberalism and conservatism uh, in, in America. How many of you are familiar with, with the Dark Knight trilogy? Can I? Okay, so several of you are. Um, what, how do we get Batman? How did we get Batman? How did Batman start, right? Isn't that the first one, Batman Begins? How did Batman begin? I hear actually that, 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 that Dr. Cohen won't give extra credit unless people respond to these questions. That's weird. <laughs> Well, he chose the, the bat as a symbol of fear. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how to explain it. Well, what, why, what happened to him that he needed a symbol of fear? Yeah. And he was orphaned and fell down a well. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> fell down a well and all these bats came. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was terrifying to him, which is why ultimately he chooses that symbol of fear. But what... What else happens, right? For a while when he grows up, right, he's still Bruce Wayne. Uh, and in fact, Bruce Wayne is gonna go seek revenge on the individual that killed his parents, 
he goes to the courtroom where he's going to actually gun down this criminal who shot his parents. But unfortunately, the crime boss, uh, uh, Carmen Falcone, beats him to it. Because Joe Chill, of course, is going to rat out the entire mafioso organization that's running, that's running Gotham. And so Bruce Wayne feels deprived of this, of this revenge that he was going to seek. And so he goes and he goes into the, 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 the mob boss's uh, restaurant uh, in this really seedy part of Gotham. And he's going to stand up to the mafia and, and, and the mob boss makes fun of him. Right? Look at you know, Prince of Gotham walking in here thinking he knows anything about right, what, what criminals are and what, what this element is or that this action is going to mean anything. Right? Uh, and in fact, it's, it's really uh, Falcone uh, in throwing him out uh, that, uh, that inspires Bruce Wayne then to go and actually learn what it means to be a criminal. Because what he begins to see in that moment is that he is completely powerless. This billionaire, right, who has seemingly everything, is powerless to be able to restore order within the state because he needs to become something larger. The state is ineffective, right? The police are corrupt in Gotham. The institutions are impotent or also corrupt, right? They're run by crime. People live in fear. Bruce Wayne needs to become something more. Right? And so he goes and he travels around with a bunch of criminal groups. He never becomes a real criminal himself because he'll only ever steal from Wayne Industries. Right? So he's just stealing from himself, but he's learning about this criminal element. Uh, and it's actually in, a, I believe it was in a Turkish prison uh, that he was approached uh, by an, uh, a man representing uh, uh, Raza Ghul and the League of Shadows, where they're going to teach Bruce Wayne uh, how to become something more. It's where then Bruce Wayne ultimately sort of sheds part of his identity to embrace uh, the Batman, to become a symbol of something larger, because he's going to impose order back on this community that had been overrun, where the state had failed time and again to protect the people of Gotham and to preserve actual order. Right? So this is very different than the Adam West Batman who used to just hang out until Commissioner Gordon would give him a call and say, hey, let's work together on something. Right? This is a person now who's going to be working completely outside of the state and in a lot of ways countermanding what the state is even trying to preserve. Joe, yeah. When you think of the original Batman, I always think of the 1960s, the social unrest that existed, and the difference in the hero then at that point in a time of what was viewed as, as social unrest, right? Mm -hmm. Throughout the 60s. Well, and it predates most of the real serious social unrest. Right. Um, I'm not the civil rights era. No, not so civil rights, but then it kind of calmed down a little bit because he had the Voting Rights Act that had been passed before this came out. Well, the original Batman was, was 65. Yeah. 65, 66. So it's only a year after the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. So I, that's why, that's why I, I think of it as uh, that it feels like it, it tries to capture a little bit on at least what that era was like in the 1960s and where our social consciousness was at that point versus right now. Well, and, and, and interestingly enough, I think when you look at the themes that come out of the, the 1960s Batman and actually a lot of the, the comics of that era, right, and what was known as sort of the golden age of comics and then what was inspired from that, those are, are comics that are attempting to actually sort of uh, uh, re-embrace uh, the, the, the American idea, right? It was a reinforcing of the state. And when we think about the social movements even at the time, the social movements, although there were some pushing for really exclusionary, more nationalistic movements uh, within the, the, the broader framework, uh, a, a lot of the mainstream sort of civil rights efforts were an attempt to make America expand its citizenship, expand its right, expand the promise, not work outside of that promise because it had ultimately become a failure. I would argue that over time what begins to happen is just as we enter into uh, sort of the th uh, second and third waves uh, of, of civil rights and as we enter into uh, really a postmodern political age where our discourse becomes really fractionalized uh, and becomes reinforced in these small sort of echo chambers uh, that, that seem to all hold that theirs is the only real sort of value 
and way of looking at the world, that's where we start to get some of these darker images, right? And, and so I think that what we see in those films is understandable in thinking about the differences between what the movements were trying to do at one time versus where we are now as a, as a society. So I, I, wanna, I, I wanna be conscious of, of time here uh, and get to uh, some of the ways in which uh, uh, the Christopher Nolan's Batman attempts to engage in a political program. I wanna make it very clear uh, that, that while uh, Batman presents, the Dark Knight presents, uh, a, a theoretical framework for understanding politics, it does not do it from an individually consistent way. Uh, and that's the interesting thing about somebody like Nolan is he grabs a little bit of this kind of conservatism, a little bit of that kind of conservatism, and sort of remakes a character where we can see a number of these political thinkers and political traditions under the conservative umbrella operating all at the same time. So I start actually with, with David Hume, because I think that uh, it's actually a Humean element, a Humean strain, uh, of, of uh, politics that we see uh, really underwriting a number of the, the, the social conservative movements and social conservative thinking within the United States. David Hume uh, really strongly inspired James Madison's understanding of how social order needed to be based on a Humean understanding of what the individual was like. Uh, and David Hume uh, talked about the notion of, of how politics itself Right, should be based on practices that are embedded in common life, in our traditions, rather than in more abstract concepts like rights or the consent of the governed, right, democracy. And the reason for that is because Hume actually sees those abstractions as working against the principles of political authority, working against social order. That when we have individual rights, that means that there are times that we become more important than a social good. Now think about that for a minute and think about exactly what due process is designed to do, right? We may have lots of reasons to believe that somebody is very, very guilty of an incredibly heinous crime, but due process means that we have to go through a very strict process in order to be able to try to prove that individual guilt, or guilty, right? Or to even gather evidence to see if we might have made a mistake in our understandings, right? In other words, it places the individual at a position of primacy and that the state is actually trying to work to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this individual is guilty. And for Hume, mm, that can sometimes get in the way of, of actual social good, of social order. And that rather than thinking of abstract concepts of rights such as freedom of speech, we ought to be thinking about uh, what, what type of speech we ought to engage in. What are our responsibilities in engaging in communication? Right? In that way, he actually looks at saying that sometimes there is a social good that should trump individual rights and that abstract sort of notion. And Hume also feels that legitimacy of political authority rests on the habit of obedience. In other words, that, that we begin to see things as legitimate in terms of authority because we're habituated to understand systems of order, political structure. And so what's interesting then is that that means that authority or the power to control would exist a priori of any kind of willful act that we would have, thus undermining this idea that we entered into a social contract Right, that we came together and that we formed a state based on principles of rights. Hume would say actually authority existed before that was even enabled to happen. There had to be structures of authority and that ultimately we get habituated towards those which undermines this idea of, of rights as being the core of any kind of political order. <clears throat> 
And for individuals like Hume, anarchy is a concept that ought to be avoided above all other things, right? Anarchy meaning the complete dissolution, destruction of the state, the elimination uh, of a social order. Um, and I'll have to qualify it, I guess, is by saying Hobbesian natural uh, state of nature kind of anarchy, because otherwise Dan's going to tell me it has too many rules, and then it's a, it's a completely different discussion. Uh, but anarchy is to be avoided because there's, there's virtually, uh, it's virtually in no one's self-interest, right? That, that absent the state, uh, right, we, we can't form uh, meaningful political bonds. Uh, uh, conservatives like Hume, again, tend to buy into that uh, that notion of, uh, of, of Hobbesian state of nature uh, where, uh, where we might cooperate for a period of time but only insofar as it's in our interest and when it stops being in our interest then we end up degenerating into warfare, right? So ultimately it leads to a, a life that Hobbes describes as nasty, uh, brutish, and short uh, and that's the kind of anarchy that, that conservatives uh, like, uh, like uh, Hume see. And so it's the need to prevent society from falling into disorder that conservatives would ultimately argue that we need to establish authority and to have that operate, even if it's against sometimes those very principles that we say we want to preserve. Right? In, the, in the film, and I know you can't see the, 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 the image very well because of the, the, the light, but uh, the, the district attorney, Harvey Dent, who was supposed to be the white knight of Gotham, representing all that was good and right about the state, all that was good and right uh, about these institutions, uh, once, uh, uh, once his uh, face uh, is horribly burned uh, and, uh, and his, uh, uh, his girlfriend uh, uh, is killed, uh, he, he goes mad. Uh, and, and he loses all belief and understanding in the state as being able to preserve this, that you can't uh, somehow solve these problems, these, these great existential threats by, de by being a decent person or abiding by values or justice or the law. Uh, his, 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 uh, his quotation, you thought we could be decent men in an indecent time. Right? And this is where I, I conservatives actually would, would argue that you're right. Sometimes there are such threats that it would cause us to actually step outside of those values that we would hold dear because that's the only way that we can preserve and protect order. That's the only way that we can restore order to a society and prevent that existential threat. And that's where Batman then steps in. The state has utterly failed. The institutions are either, as I mentioned before, corrupt or impotent. And Batman, right, Bruce Wayne as the Dark Knight, steps outside of any of the constraints of the state. Even working against those values and, and some of the, the, the challenges that are presented by those individuals that are closest to him, right, Lucius Fox or Rachel Dawes or, or even Alfred. Right? Those individuals who would warn him, you can't take on this kind of power because ultimately that is a violation of these principles that you're supposedly there to protect. But he goes against all of those things in order to try to restore order, to try to restore justice where the state has ultimately failed. And those pursuits set him directly at odds with the political institutions that make up Gotham and at its core against the kinds of liberal protections that ultimately define the American political state. Batman as a vigilante figure becomes a representation of anti-statism. The state has failed us. Our institutions are unable to deal with the threats that are all around us. These institutions can no longer help us. Right? His vigilantism is actually an anti-statist argument. That as the hero, Batman actually takes on and dons the role of being the metaphorical sovereign. In other words, the state can't provide order. 
The sovereign is the one who can do that. And the sovereign is ultimately justified in engaging in any action that is necessary to restore order because that's the only way that these principles can even exist in normal times. Now what's interesting too is when you start to think about the villains that are in Gotham, they are not of Gotham. In fact, as in many, 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 and I'm not willing to say all because I've not seen every single action hero movie, the villain is often sometimes of external existential threat. It's not one of the community, right? It's a threat being imposed on the community. So it's not like Batman's turning against the people of Gotham. There's this existential external threat that he's going to rise up and protect the people of Gotham in. The hero, however, right, Bruce Wayne, the son, crown prince of Gotham, right, he is Gotham City. He is of the community. He is part of the community. He's both the elite and his family engaged in numerous charitable actions is of the people, right? He's a child of Gotham. It's the community sort of insulating against external threats. And we can talk a little bit about that, how that feeds into in all of these narrative perceptions of external uh, individuals, people around the world, the quote unquote other, right? And the formation of the other as being individuals who are different from us, who are outside of our community that become a threat in terms of the perception uh, of those who would see that as being villainous. Batman is somebody who's going to uh, uh, see that around him these ineffective liberal democratic actors, right? These state institutions that are ineffective, they're actually just enabling the enemy, right? Because they're enabling the enemy because they're giving the enemy all these protections of laws and due process. They're not willing to do what's necessary to take the enemy down. So that just enables the enemy to act. And so the hero, right, Batman, declares a state of exception, right? We value, we hold these truths as being important, but not right now because the threat's too great. Declares the state of exception because, as the film seems to suggest, the only way to preserve the law is to break it, is to go outside of the law. That's the only way to restore order. And so ultimately then, Batman begins to reflect this kind of neoconservative distrust of liberalism and the principles upon which the liberal state is founded on. Now, why do I say neoconservatism? Well, that's because uh, ultimately, if we were to think of Hume as being somebody and that, that Hume and Burke, uh, individuals who represent a sort of classical or traditional kind of conservatism, there was sort of a new brand of conservatism, neo uh, or new conservatism, uh, that began to arise in political thinking that began to take elements that are actually very authoritarian, very reactionary in nature, and wed those to the principles of conservatism to create this kind of new political thinking. One of those individuals who was very influential in doing that was Carl Schmitt, who argued that the sovereign, or the ultimate political authority, is not what's defined by law necessarily, but instead, whoever has the ability to declare the state of exception in a time of perceived crisis. In a time of crisis, <clears throat> the sovereign is freed from the usual constraints of law, from the limits that are imposed on, that it's no longer crippled by procedural limitations, that it must do whatever is necessary in order to be able to establish an equilibrium within the state, in order, again, to restore order. And Carl Schmitt inspires thinkers like Daniel Bell uh, and Irving Kristol, uh, who were very actually influential uh, in defining a lot of, of modern conservative uh, uh, political agenda uh, and had uh, a, an incredible amount uh, of influence uh, on the formation of uh, the Republican Party platform, uh, in particular uh, uh, during, uh, during the uh, second Bush administration, there were a number of individuals within the administration who used to cite these two thinkers in particular uh, as, a, as sort of a justification uh, for a number of the, the, the efforts that were engaged in uh, in the uh, war on terrorism. 
that, uh, that ultimately uh, these neoconservative thinkers uh, argued that liberalism's evolution has gone from one of freedom, of individual rights, liberty, and freedom, to one of state control. The, the, the modern phrase that I've, that I've heard, uh, and, and some of you may, uh, does anybody know who Steve Bannon is? Has anybody heard that name recently? Right? He's a, he's a top level advisor uh, within, within Donald Trump's administration. He uses a different phrase uh, than state control. Uh, has anybody heard the phrase the administrative state? That's, uh, that's one that, that has become very popularized and it's, it's introduced, it's, it's worked its way uh, into a, a, a lot of uh, recent press conferences. Uh, and it's this notion that somehow there's no longer really even freedom because the state has become so administratively heavy that it's begun to regulate freedom out of social action. So that, again, is that, that, that sort of thread of neoconservative political thinking within modern politics. Uh, and it's this notion that somehow once the state becomes so administratively burdened, it becomes ineffective to actually deal with problems. That you need something that's outside of the administrative state in order to be able to actually deal with real problems. Now, like con traditional conservatives, neocons embrace this notion of traditionalism. Right? They, 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 they actually embrace the notion, preservation of values and of traditional institutions. But unlike con uh, traditional conservatives, who were incredibly skeptical of any kind of top-down authority, who preserved localism, right, to preserve cultural institutions as a means of responding to social problems, neoconservatives embrace top-down, state-mandated policy to affect change. In other words, centralization is now a tool of power rather than a tool of vice. That this becomes a way that if we can somehow have centralized power that is unaccountable to the people, then that can actually be used to impose uh, sort of positive responses uh, when crises arise. And neoconservatives began to look out and criticize then what's happening with liberalism as it forms into the administrative state, saying that liberalism can ultimately devolve into two primary ways, uh, or two primary ends. First, it either becomes valueless nihilism, where we become so focused on equality and inclusion and multiculturalism that nothing has value anymore because there are no values that are enabled to be placed in a position of primacy over any others. Or it becomes uh, what is an, uh, you know, sort of referred to as brutal statism, that the state becomes such an incredibly centralized authority that it begins to crack down on any true freedom. Right, so that was coming from uh, the, the thinker Leo Strauss, uh, who also falls into uh, that, that uh, sort of neoconservative tradition. And I say that because we see that criticism emerge within the villains of Batman. First and foremost, we have liberalism as valueless nihilism, the Joker. The individual who uh, makes claims such as the world is only, or the only sensible way to live in this world is without rules. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. You know, I just do things, right? There's no value there. There's no there there, right? He's a person that Alfred described as one of those individuals who just wants to see the world burn. And one of his lines, introduce a little anarchy, upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. I'm an agent of chaos. Right? The Joker is there to destroy institutions, to tear it all down because none of it has meaning anymore. He's the representation of the ends of liberalism from the Straussian point of view, this valueless kind of nihilism in which nothing makes sense. And those other villains within Gotham represent the other end of the perspective uh, that, that Strauss introduces. The notion of liberalism as brutal statism. Now, I kid you not, this slide, and you can go back and look, I had this slide uh, in the presentation before the election. 
this quotation from this movie was actually sort of paraphrased in a number of people, and of course the administration denies it, but the Trump administration in his inaugural address to the United States used part of Bain's speech. This notion of, of, of right here, uh, the, you know, the, the powerful be ripped from their decadent nests. Uh, oh, no, it was this one right here. We take Gotham from the corrupt, the rich, the oppressors of generations who have kept you down with mids of opportunity, and we give it back to you, the people. And Trump said almost those exact words uh, to the point where if you're ever fans of the, uh, the online uh, uh, comedy uh, uh, Funny or Die, uh, you can go on and Chris Kattan does this wonderful Bane character uh, and, and he goes on and he's criticized, like, come on, Trump, man, like you had to take that from me too. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really, it's, it's very, very funny. Uh, and, and again, I, I think that uh, I, I don't want to dwell too much on, uh, you know, trying to make the connections between you see how this impacts this, but, but what I think is really critical is to again think about how ultimately we start to think uh, about some of these principles, some of these ideas, uh, and how those get represented. But Bain, uh, who uh, works as an agent essentially of Raz Agul and later uh, his daughter Talia Agul, uh, they're set out on ultimately raising Gotham, right? They're going to destroy it, uh, but they're going to do it actually in a way uh, that, uh, that engages in sort of a revolutionary overthrow of the state to impose a very uh, a brutal form uh, of statism until inevitably they'll destroy everything, right, through, through a giant bomb uh, underneath the city. Uh, and I just, I, I want to finish the rest of that quotation because I think, again, it captures this idea of liberalism as brutal statism. Uh, Gotham is yours, none shall interfere. Do as you please. Start by storming Blackgate, the prison, and freeing the oppressed. Step forward, those who would serve for an army. It should be an army, not an uh, army will be raised. The powerful will be ripped from their decadent nests and cast out of the cold world that we know and, endu uh, and endure. Courts will be convened. Spoils will be enjoyed. Blood will be shed. The police will survive as they learn to serve true justice. This great city, it will endure. Gotham uh, will survive. Right. And all of those then, uh, both of those versions uh, of liberalism uh, as, uh, as an in from that neoconservative perspective then get represented uh, in these films where Batman as uh, a symbol of the state uh, is as much defined as that which he is battling against as he is an independent character. In other words, Batman becomes a response to these threads of perceived threat which are coming from, again, that neoconservative perspective, are coming from the ends of liberalism. So Bruce Wayne at great personal sacrifice grows a beard, becomes hobbled. It's, it, I think we're a lot alike in a lot of ways. I, I, a great personal sacrifice attempts to preserve this belief in decency of the political elites. Uh, what's interesting uh, about, uh, about uh, The Dark Knight uh, is that at the end of The Dark Knight Rises, the second film, or I'm sorry, The, the Dark Knight, no, The Dark Knight, period, uh, is, uh, uh, is that uh, he ultimately tries to preserve the image of D.A. Harvey Dent, not as Two-Face, uh, the, the villain, but as the white knight, as the savior of Gotham, uh, because ultimately that's the way that then he can restore order. But of course, a really critical question is, what if Bruce Wayne decides not to yield power? Right? What happens when Bruce Wayne decides that there is no end to the state of exception? Right? What happens when the Batman decides that everything becomes a threat? It's all an existential threat. What happens then? And the films sort of deal with this, not in a very historically accurate uh, way, uh, but certainly in a way that, uh, that uh, is intended to sort of laugh off this idea uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that, that somehow uh, Batman wouldn't uh, cede power back. Uh, D.A. Harvey Dent said, uh, uh, when the enemies were at their gates, the Romans would suspend democracy and appoint one man to protect the city. Uh, and, and Dawes's response, Rachel Dawes's response, which is never really dealt with, uh, is uh, um, the last man who they appointed to protect the Republic was named Caesar, and he never gave up his power. And Dent responds then, and this is the dismissive part, okay, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. 
right? And that ultimately is what Batman takes on, right? He becomes the villain uh, for, uh, for the people of Gotham for some time so that they, so he can preserve order and then step away and then they can, you know, they can have their city uh, back. Uh, maybe that's what makes him uh, heroic. Uh, but in a lot of ways, uh, that's uh, the people of Gotham really turning to a figure that, that we don't fully understand. Right? When we look to those individuals who are willing to step outside of uh, the, the traditional order, we have to ask then logically, where are those lines drawn? Um, how do we ensure uh, that, that we remain somehow protected or that order would ever be restored? Uh, right? These films would celebrate uh, the hero as this anti-state actor uh, who will preserve us from these existential threats uh, really start to impart a conditioning uh, where in the United States, right, as consumers of this kind of entertainment, right, we become much more susceptible to arguments that make those kinds of claims about suspending rights. Where we become more willing to question whether or not individual rights, freedoms, and due process are really all that important. And if you haven't done anything wrong, what do you have to fear kind of thing? And those are very dangerous to any kind of society that ultimately uh, roots itself in principles of rule of law, of rights, of principles of justice, and this form of political equality. I feel that I, I, I tried to wrap that up a little bit quickly because I know I've only got about five minutes left, and I wanted to make sure that I had enough time to engage in conversation. Uh, so I'm going to stop with the presentation portion and, and move to any kinds of questions, comments, feedback that you all have. It's fascinating to me that the neoconservative critique of liberalism echoes very, very closely the Nazi critique of the Weimar system. Um, so we say it's new, but you know, that's 80 years ago. 90 years ago in the 1920s. Sure, I, I, though, I, and I, here's where, where I agree, because they're both rooted in a same kind of reactionary political attitude, right? That there's a notion that somehow there's something great to restore, right? Some kind of recovery uh, story, and that we're reacting against uh, liberalism or freedoms or uh, the state run amok, uh, and that we need to restore uh, us back to a, a principle in time. Um, now, that being said, and, and of course, uh, Strauss uh, is, uh, is, uh, is somebody who echoes uh, a lot of, of, of fascist political thinkers, not just from the Nazi uh, traditions, but from other uh, uh, fascist traditions as well. And yet, um, it's, it's also something that I wouldn't fully equate, uh, the, the kind of neoconservative perspective, um, uh, with, with the, you know, what the intended outcomes right, of, the, uh, of the, the fascist state are, right? So they've got very kind of similar, you're absolutely right, critiques of liberalism, but then take that to, I think, very different ends uh, as to uh, instead of trying to move towards sort of an ongoing state wherein everybody has like their place in the social order and beginning to view the state more like an organic body, uh, than, it as, uh, than as some kind of institutional product of human action. Um, juxtapose that with uh, individuals who would use state power to try to dismantle administration and ultimately, uh, you know, if, if the ends are to be fulfilled, right, preserve or, or to return to some kind of more localized control. Um, but that being said, I, I think you're right. they're, they're, they're born of the same river uh, in terms of reactionary uh, kinds of principles. But I can also say so are Ayn Rand and Karl Marx. They're both born of the same uh, river as well because they both sort of have the same principle of, of what it means to produce something, to make something of value. Then they just split it into very different ends as to then, well, what does that then mean by way of rights? Uh, so. Yeah, uh, I would differ on the one, the one area with the, in that they both do, talk about this idea of the sovereign. But he didn't use that phrase, but it, it fits very much what he saw himself as. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I, I think that there, there are a lot of really strong parallels. Um, and I think that there are, uh, at least from a political theory perspective, uh, there, there are different ends that are, I think are envisioned by both movements. 
Yeah, please. Um, one thing that I just kind of found interesting or in my able to connect to was before when you talked about how uh, the people become more important, important than like due process or rights, uh, I could kind of see that happening after like 9 11 when we had a huge like upfront of national security and like all that, that happened where there's like more security and more monitoring and different things. But the people were willing to give that up for the importance of safety. Yeah, and I and again, I think that that's uh, that's sort of what you know. I, I think what makes that end more palatable, right? As we begin to think about why is it that people are so quick uh, to want to sacrifice aspects of freedom and protection in order to be able to uh, have that restoration of order. In part, we understand it through the sort of political history and the, uh, and the traditions that come to form uh, sort of the core uh, of belief in the United States. I think another part of it is how these issues get framed time and time and time again uh, so that we begin to see the representation of, well, when the, when the state is ineffective, right, it can lead to all these horrible ends, right? Remember, after September 11th, uh, I remember, uh, you know, people walking around saying we're in a state of terrorism now. Right, this is this is the new normal. Right from that attack, right. So people were seeing that as this existential threat that would be perpetual unless the state did something immediately to react. And we were willing to accept almost anything the state was willing to do, right, as long as it made us feel safe, right. And so there were a number then of, of very rapid political changes uh, that, that that were made uh, that really set up questions. Of, of security and individual rights and due process. Uh, and I think at least in part, one of the reasons we can understand that is because again, how these issues of existential threats are constantly framed through that consumer uh, entertainment, how we've been socialized through our stories to begin to perceive the world around us. So in your research, have you seen a theme where the pop culture genres depict the US or whatever the society is, is uh, always in a state of war because it's, the idea is you need to centralize power, take away rights, like Alex is saying, because it's a crisis or it's a war. You know, if we think about our U.S. recent history, we move from Cold War to war on terror. I mean, even in the 90s, there's terrorist concerns, there's war on drugs. So do you see that in your research? That it's like always a time of war, so we always need to spend individual liberty. Yeah, well, within, again, within the, the action hero uh, genre, right, and the, and the subgenres that go with that, um, absolutely. Right? Even, even when I think, I, I was really hoping that, that, for example, Captain America Civil War was going to set up a complex argument uh, of, of trying to balance, you know, what do we do with these superhumans that are not answerable to any state, right? But in, instead, that, that argument, which it was building up to, it's just sort of like, yeah, but then a crisis really emerges again and now we're all on board, right? Then we can, we can deal with that again and, and let them try to come get me and I'll, you know, and I'll stand up and, and, and take the law in my own hands again. Uh, and, and so I think that within those action hero genres, it's always a state of crisis. It may not be full-blown war, uh, right? But, but there's always some kind of breakdown of the state there's an inability of the state necessarily to respond unless we engage in these sort of uh, 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 extra, uh, uh, extra statist measures. And that either is from uh, some kind of individual acting outside of the state uh, or the elimination of the barriers within the state that enable heroic figures, right? Like a president, for example, to stand up. There's a reason why we never see Congress, right? As the hero in an action film. One, it wouldn't be interesting. Uh, and, and two, because institutions aren't heroic. People are, symbols are, ideas are. And so what then you do is you, you, you always create these sort of barriers. And in fact, one of the things that uh, I, I'm hoping to work on uh, next is, uh, is looking at uh, the way that in any kind of political movie, um, Congress is always set up as the enemy uh, and as something that creates problems for the heroic president. Uh, and not just as a, we've got differences of opinions that we need to work through committee uh, and compromise, but instead there's a real enemy creation. Anybody who opposes the presidency somehow is demonized, uh, vilified, and then we usually find out that they're corrupt and doing it for the wrong kinds of ends. Yeah. 
Um, so in any time the, uh, the, the, the presidency is sort of elevated to that heroic status, uh, uh, bureaucratic agencies in Congress are always seen as an obstacle to be eliminated, never something to be worked through. And I, I wanna work through that a little bit more. So it, it, one, it depends on the genre. Uh, and, uh, and two, if we're talking about these kinds of films, absolutely, there is always that state of crisis and there's always the replacing of the sovereign somehow by this other force. Any, maybe, yeah. Um, like I might be going out on the limb here, but when you're saying like Congress, which is uh, like a lot of different people, I can kind of connect that to the Justice League, for example, where it's not just one, Hero, it's multiple heroes coming together and working together to solve a problem. Now, I don't know what problem it is that they face in like a movie, so I just kind of think that um, maybe we might see some representation of that, but maybe in a program. Well, and I, you know, and again, I think that you're going to see the, a, a different version of what we already see in the Avengers, just with darker lighting, uh, than, uh, and because it's a DC movie. Um, but, but you know, within that, that, that sort of the, the, the I almost said super friends, that dates me. Uh, uh, within the Justice League uh, narrative, uh, Batman once again does a little something interesting. Um, and you see this actually introduced even before some of the, you know, in, in, in some of these other films. I think it was uh, at the end of uh, Suicide Squad, which I think I'm one of six people who didn't think that was a terrible movie. Uh, and, uh, and Batman gets files on everybody. Um, and in, in some of the, the, the Justice League um, sort of narratives, uh, Batman has actually assembled together all of the weapons that will take down every single one of the other superheroes because even within that framework, Batman sees that there is a necessary moment in time where he may have to step in and reimpose order because he sees himself as being sort of, again, that, that, that sovereign that has to sometimes declare a state of an emergency even amongst the exceptional. It makes like a little kryptonite bullet. Right, well, and that's right. And that's, yeah, yeah, he just has really interesting gadgets. I, I started actually really worry about myself when I realized for a long time my two favorite superheroes were, were Batman and Iron Man. And then I was just like, I just have like a thing with like billionaires with gadgets, right? It's some probably Peter Pan fantasy that I've got because I never grew up. But. Yeah. <laughs> So any, any final questions? I know I've, I've, I've really imposed on your time tonight. Yeah, please. So, I, I'm sorry, but the people that say that they would rather have um, the overall people's rights rather than individual rights, what happens when somebody is said that they're guilty and they're not? I mean, if, if it's all about the citizen's right, it doesn't, you don't have any individual rights or purpose. I mean, doesn't that kind of just make us all into I mean, I don't want to say robots, but to an extent that we're all just kind of doing what we have to do rather than being part of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, I think <clears throat> what the, again, coming from a, a political theory perspective, what I think a conservative would argue is, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong inherently with the idea of rights per se. Most of the time, rights are just fine, right? It enables us a framework w in which we can act in some kind of social area. But we shouldn't let that abstract notion of rights get in the way of, of, of us doing what needs to be done in times of crisis, right? And so the, the, the conservative uh, political thinker would say that rights only have value insofar as they're practical for achieving some kind of collective communal good, right? And in their mind, that, that, that community good is what should be strived for and that, that rights as a concept are devoid of any real value except as tools that help us to achieve the common good. But in times where in rights can step in the way of the common good. Um, if, if uh, for example, uh, I were to start using, uh, uh, you know, incredibly, um, this is probably not the best example, uh, but, uh, but really uh, just vile rhetoric all the time where it was really tearing away at sort of a social order and then I just say, ah, freedom of speech, right? The true political conservative, right, from, from a political theory perspective would say, we ought not let that individual claim to some kind of license or liberty reign supreme all the time. That sometimes we need to censor activities for the social good. 
And so that's where you'll see conservative arguments, for example, uh, that, that align uh, in a lot of ways with, with a number of feminist arguments against pornography. Right? The notions that, that somehow individuals' ability to just kind of do whatever they want and say it's a form of expression and the market accepts it, right? they see that as, as individualism run amok and something that ought to be censored and pushed out of society because it's devoid of uh, social benefit and it actually leads to social harm. And so in that way, then a conservative would say most of the time, right, at least a conservative within the United States, or most of the time, freedom of speech, freedom of expression is what helps democracy work, but that's not universal and it ought not be treated as a universal that trumps the social good. Yeah. So where, where's the conservative then take or the line on the crisis that does never end? You know, so you, you mentioned, you alluded to a little bit mm -hmm. kind of with the Harvey Dent comment, mm -hmm. and I think of course, because I'm a German history specialist, and, I think of the Reichstag fire. You know, we have this crisis. We got to get all the communists. We got to got to mm -hmm. you know get all these people arrested. But that crisis never ends. It just sort of continues. So. Well, and this is this is where I I, I also have I, and and what I what I hope uh, comes out of this is I'll, I, is the, the the sense that whenever I say liberal, I say we. Whenever I say conservative, I say we. Whenever I say fascist, I tend to say we. I, I can, and so, so I, I will admit though now to a personal aspect of my politics, I'm Orwellian in the sense that, uh, that Orwell has that, that really beautiful line uh, in 1984 uh, that no revolutionary movement ever uh, uh, captured control just to then later uh, cede it uh, back to the people, right? That, that the real danger here uh, is, uh, is that threat of once someone takes over then the crisis in order to continue to justify the legitimacy of power uh, is, is to continue to manufacture crisis after crisis after crisis uh, so as to never uh, leave that state of exception. Uh, and that becomes the danger that, that ultimately Harvey Dent says, well then you're either the hero, right, because you've done something and then you step away, uh, or you live long enough to become the villain where you then become that thing that you were battling against. Now, what makes Batman, of course, a hero, uh, as, uh, as uh, opposed to many movements throughout history, is that ultimately, once that existential crisis has been completely eliminated, Ra's al Ghul is gone, Talia Ghul is gone, Bane is gone, all of these existential threats are gone, right? Then Batman fakes his own death and moves to Paris with Catwoman, right? Because he, he, that was, he, he fulfilled his responsibility order is restored, people believe in the state, he's not there to tear down institutions. What becomes dangerous is when uh, we can't trust uh, individuals to act like stories do, right? When we can't trust them to become the heroes. Uh, and that becomes, I think, the danger. So, and I'm happy to, to stay and chat with people individually. I also wanna let folks uh, 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 drive home. I do wanna leave you with one last anecdote. Uh, one of my favorite moments uh, in all of the, the uh, primaries in this last presidential election uh, was, when, uh, was when now President Trump flew his uh, uh, helicopter into uh, 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 Iowa uh, for one of the early, uh, early uh, sort of primary events. And this little kid walked up to him and, uh, and saw a billionaire uh, just hop off his plane to come around and have people gather around him. And he just said, are you Batman? So I'll leave it up to you to whether or not he actually is Batman.